So you'll notice, first of all, that my title is different from the one that's in your uh, programs. Uh, this is a little more relevant to the subject of the session. You also notice that my institution is different from the one in the program. I was at one time at JPL, but eight years ago I moved to NASA Goddard, and I'm there now. So I guess you can take the boy out of the institution, but you can't take the institution out of the boy. All right, so I, I, I'm going to try and, and give an overview of the strengths and limitations of what we can do with satellites. I'll give a lot of different kinds of examples. But I wanted to step back for a minute and make a point which, since there are many modelers here, I feel is important to make, which is that even the direct aerosol radiator forcing and its anthropogenic components are not solved problems. So there's a bit of success here that we've had with um, our satellite work. Um, back in AR3 2001, uh, the aerosol effects were listed as very low in terms of the confidence. And then by AR4, after EOS plus six years, it was just medium low. And part of the reason for that, maybe a large part of the reason for that, was that with some of our satellite instruments, MISER and MODIS, for example, and the Aeronet uh, system, we were in a position to constrain aerosol optical depth on a monthly global basis better than had ever been done before. And the modelers were able to use that as a constraint. And so this change was justified. You also notice, however, that in 2001, the aerosol types were parsed out here, and then they collapsed them all down into one, which is a sort of tacit admission that perhaps we don't know so much about the differences amongst the aerosol types. I'll come back to that in a minute. So here's the, uh, a, a, a nice figure that sort of illustrates this. This is MISER and different MODIS, Polder, and other satellite instruments, and the Aeronet down here. And this is the synthesis that was put together of the aerosol optical depth which was then used. However, aerosol type is all over the place. And this is now the AR4 results. Uh, I haven't seen a similar analysis of the AR5 results, but we have not provided, we have not yet provided constraints on aerosol type on a global basis from the satellites. So those constraints are not really very well established as yet, and so that's sort of the cutting edge. That's where we need to go. Next. And much to my chagrin here, it was stated in AR5 that the uncertainty or the confidence, rather, in the aerosol direct radiator forcing was high. Um, and, and my sense is, I'm going to say this for the benefit of, of those of you who might be thinking about what happens in AR6, um, is that between AR4 and AR5, there were a lot of model intercomparison exercises. And so the differences, the diversity amongst the models diminish to some extent. And since diversity is sometimes confused with uncertainty, this high probably has at least something to do with that convergence of models without necessarily adequate aerosol type constraints. Well, I'm going to talk about MISER, MODIS, and Calypso, a number of the satellite instruments. Uh, for those who might not be familiar, uh, MISER has nine cameras pointed in nine directions. Uh, along the flight path, it's a polar orbiting satellite. Uh, we get the whole Earth about once a week in four spectral bands and nine angles. And we're able to do a variety of things. Uh, one of the things we can do is put, provide some constraints on aerosol type. Now, part of the story here is what we can do and what we can't do. Um, there are actually, th this is now January and July. Uh, I've got optical depth constraints here. When the optical depth is below about 0.2, our sensitivity to aerosol type diminishes dramatically. This is an important thing to remember, that in the satellite retrievals, aerosol type is much more difficult to retrieve and much more sensitive to the retrieval conditions than aerosol optical depth, especially for a multi-angle instrument. Uh, there, are, uh, there are several reasons why. One of them is just that we have a systematic set of slant paths, which allows us to constrain the optical depth very well. Uh, but when the optical depth gets low and other factors are involved um, in, in the observations, uh, our constraints on aerosol type are, are very poor. Um, so there are three levels here. Uh, the first one is these blue, and I wish the lights would be a little dimmer. You could see these are now, these three are spherical non-absorbing types of particles. These two are spherical absorbing mixtures. 
And these are mixtures that include non-spherical particles. These are the kinds of constraints at the very top level that we can make under good retrieval conditions. Um, then there are these sort of groupings of 10, uh, 1 to 10. These are different mixtures. And within each grouping here, the size varies, but the other properties of the particles do not vary especially. Um, and, and the ratios of components vary a bit. And, and then from here to here, different components are mixed. So more detail with these 74 mixtures, uh, less detail but more robust with the spherical and non-spherical and so on. So we can do a bit better than this global result. And I just want to show this one example, which will also, again, illustrate the strengths and the limitations here. This was from the Seekers field campaign. Uh, we got a strip right through the middle here of the United States, and we captured five aerosol air masses, three plumes of smoke of different ages, and then a continental background, and an area that was a mix of continental background and smoke. And we were able to do some retrievals. Now, up here, this is plume one and two. This is plume one up here and plume two down there. And you see that qualitatively, we're able to say that smoke plume one has small absorbing, mostly spherical particles. Smoke plume two has smaller, less absorbing, and more spherical particles. In a sense, the passive remote sensing aerosol type constraint is a column effective categorical variable. Think of it that way. It can be useful, but it doesn't have all the information you need. So, some of the limitations. Okay, at a very high level, polar orbiters provide snapshots only. It's difficult with the satellite remote sensing to probe the cloud base. You've heard that from several people today. Um, the typical horizontal resolution is hundreds of meters or poorer, which if you're looking at, at subtle differences on tens of meter scales, you can't get them from a satellite alone. Passive imagers have very little vertical information, and active instruments such as LIDARs have very little spatial coverage. These are complementary in certain ways. I'll illustrate that in a minute. There's little information about particle microphysical properties. I've illustrated that already. Um, and bigger issues in retrieving aerosols in the presence of clouds. I'll give a couple of examples of that shortly. Um, and cloud property retrievals also are, can be aliased in the presence of aerosols. Putting a slightly finer point on a few of these, it's difficult to retrieve aerosols that are co-located with clouds because of cloud-scattered light and cloud contamination. Um, it, it is rarely possible to detect aerosol in the droplet formation region below clouds. Um, and aerosols smaller than about a tenth of a micron in size look like atmospheric gas molecules. So inferring a, a significant part of the CCN spectrum is difficult, and I'll give a couple of examples of how people are attempting to do that and, and the pluses and minuses of that. Uh, and hygroscopicity, if you're going to get it from the satellite alone, you need to connect it in some way to aerosol type, which is just a very crude qualitative constraint on size, shape, and single scattering albedo. And then, of course, environmental meteorological factors are coupled, and this is not a laboratory, this is the Earth, and so the co-variation of meteorological conditions matters, and parsing those things out is not simple, but stratification of the data is one very useful way of going about that. I'll illustrate that as we go along as well. And uh, then there are also issues associated with sampling spatial scales as well as temporal scales. Okay, so satellites are fairly blunt instruments for studying aerosol cloud interactions. That's the bottom line there. So now I'm going to illustrate a few of the historical examples, some of my favorites. There, it's a vast literature here, and it was hard to pick, but I picked a few. So these are two examples of where environmental conditions were such that you had a controlled situation, and you can compare what happened in, in the perturbed environment from the background environment. And this was mentioned earlier, the uh, ship tracks, uh, and you can see an illustration of the Toomey effect, uh, changes in the cloud optical depth and in the cloud effective radius in these plumes. And this is some of the earliest work uh, by Jim Coakley and his group. Um, Another example of that is this one from Danny Rosenfeld's paper in Science in 2000, where now using the satellite data, you can see uh, this is a multi-spectral uh, uh, image that's a false color image. Uh, 
uh, where the yellow color illustrates particles that are smaller uh, than the, the remainder of the cloud, and these are some pollution sources that are affecting the cloud. So you have a, a, a natural background that you can compare to and you can see these effects, um, at least qualitatively. Now, quantitatively, there are issues and we have to talk about those. Another class of work that's been done is what you could call broadly correlation studies. And, and they're somewhat weaker than those special cases that I showed previously uh, in terms of the conclusions you can draw, but they're quite popular because there are a lot of parameters you can measure, at least qualitatively, from the satellite, and the natural thing to do is to correlate them. So for example, here, um, this is Terry Nakajima's early work on this, uh, where the cloud, the, the cloud particle concentration and the aerosol particle concentration are illustrated here in red and green end members. And so where it's yellow, you've got a higher aerosol concentration and a smaller cloud radius, the first indirect effect or the Tumi effect that everybody talks about. And so you see at least qualitatively this behavior around the planet. Uh, there are some issues with this, um, and we can, I'll talk about those shortly. Another example of a correlation study here, this is one from Elon Koren and uh, and a number of colleagues. Uh, and here, the idea was to look for cloud invigoration over the Atlantic. Uh, the optical depth here is encoded in color. And what you see here in this suite of, of, of plots is that one over the, the cloud radius is inversely proportional to the cloud number concentration, which is proportional in some way, or at least related to, the aerosol concentration, and associated with that, the uh, aerosol optical depth. I'll say one other thing here, which is that a parameter that's quite popular in some corners of the satellite community is what we call the aerosol index, which is the product of the optical depth of aerosol, column optical depth of aerosol, and the angstrom exponent, which is minus the slope of the log of the uh, optical depth as a function of wavelength. And that parameter diminishes as the size increases. So the idea is that if you have more smaller particles, uh, the angstrom exponent goes up, and that increases the aerosol index. So for a given optical depth, you'll have more particles under those circumstances. Uh, qualitatively, um, it's a somewhat useful parameter, but when you have multimodal mixtures of aerosols in the column, the angstrom exponent is not all that obvious what it means and quantitatively, it could be all over the place. Well, one of the instruments that, in addition to Miser and MODIS, that uh, is important in this um, aerosol cloud interaction field for satellites is Calypso, active sensor, uh, just to point out that the vertical range here varies, you know, with height in the atmosphere, and the vertical resolution here goes from 30 meters near the surface to a much coarser up high, uh, we're interested here, but just bear in mind that these vary. Uh, also, the horizontal resolution varies uh, with the elevation. Um, and Calypso is, is capable of doing several things. One of them is the slice that it takes, and there's a slice here, uh, makes it possible there's a backscatter at two wavelengths and then a polarization. It's possible to parse out about six aerosol types Qualitatively, again, this is all qualitative, but you can distinguish smoke from marine aerosol from dust, which is very handy and useful, within the swath, which is 100 meters wide. Now, we can complement the vertical distribution. I guess I should have mentioned that clearly here. Uh, this is now the vertical distribution up to 20 kilometers, and you can see the distribution of aerosols. Um, this, over this, this one narrow swath here, um, with the satellite, with the multi-angle imager, we can look at the parallax here, and you can see that, and the, the apparent motion of an elevated object relative to the background from different view angles is related to the height of the object. The closer to the ground, the smaller the parallax. And so if you can take into account, for example, any proper motion of the cloud during the couple of minutes that it takes to get these several views, you can actually retrieve the plume height. This is from the Ayafalioko volcano that went off in 2010, and this is the major plume here, and this is now the stereo-derived plume height from Miser. Uh, 
And you see it's quite high up here, six kilometers or so, and then it starts to descend as it interacts with this uh, system here off uh, to the east. This is remobilized ash near the surface. There's the image here, the RGB image. This is quantitative data uh, because it's done geometrically. So this is the lower plume, this is the higher plume. You can see this is up at about five kilometers here is the maximum. Now bear in mind that this is derived by looking at the layer of maximum spatial contrast. And as a result, the plume is not completely uniform, and so you get kind of a distribution of, it's not a perfect distribution of everything from top to bottom, but you do get a sense that it's a three-dimensional plume. And so you can see the behavior there. Now here's another example of this. This is now a wildfire in Oregon. Um, and I've got these boxes marked down near the source and then going downwind. This is the miser retrieved optical depth and the angstrom exponent and the, the height. But what's of interest here is I want to show you again this vertical distribution and a very important point that comes up in it. P1 is near the source, and so you see this distribution here, the smoke is rising. And then it, it kind of settles into this layer of relative stability. This is from a model here, and there's a layer of relative stability up there. Aerosols like to transport themselves in layers of relative stability in the atmosphere if they get above the boundary layer. Now in this case, there was a big high pressure system. There were a lot of smaller fires around here. And you can see that as you go downwind, some of those fires filled the boundary layer and you actually are retrieving these two layers if you take these boxes up here, four and five. But if you consider this for a model, if you've got an upwind constraint near the source, because this only works when you can see features in the plume, you can do the stereo uh, imaging, uh, you can get the height of the plume, the injection height, the near source height, and then you have Calypso downwind, which doesn't have as much coverage, but can see through a thin layer, a subvisible layer. That's an upwind constraint from Miser, from multi-angle imaging, a downwind constraint from Calypso. And then, if the layers transport themselves in layers of relative stability, you've got a very nice set of constraints on the vertical distribution of the aerosols. And this has not been exploited adequately yet, but considering how important the vertical distribution of aerosols relative to clouds is for this aerosol cloud interaction problem, um, that might be something worth exploring further. Now, some other things that have been done with Calypso, this is now from uh, Jason Tackett and Larry DiGirolamo's ni very nice paper. Uh, during the night, especially when the signal to noise is very high, uh, you can look at the laser observations as a function of distance from the cloud edge. And they did this for a selection of clouds during the RICO campaign. And you see that near the cloud, within one pixel of the cloud, um, the, uh, well, okay, this goes out to three kilometers away, just three kilometers. And everything here is concentrated in terms of both the backscatter, which is related to the aerosol amount in some way, the optical amount at least, and the particle size. And it increases right near the cloud, which is a real effect. It's not some kind of scattering effect or anything. And you see it's concentrated at the top and the bottom. And so there's some questions about whether it's detrainment at the top of the cloud that's producing these or hygroscopic growth. It's not clear what these are exactly, but it is clear that there is a definite effect near the cloud. This is vertically integrated of these columns here. And so you can see this effect. During the day, there's scattered light that's affecting the signal. Now, uh, Tamash Varnai and, and Sasha Marshak went and looked at global data. And there they saw something very interesting. I, I think I pointed out that they went out to three kilometers, and they, they said the effect kind of died out at three kilometers, but they were only looking at these trade cumulus during the RICO campaign in this study. Well, these guys looked globally, and they saw the effects of clouds going out all the way to 15 kilometers. They used a similar technique to the other guys using the, the Calypso LIDAR and all the way out to 15 kilometers. So this means that from a remote sensing point of view, there's a lot to think about in terms of the way, especially if you've got a cloud field and 15 kilometers is less than, is less than the average distance between clouds, what you're actually seeing when you're trying to do remote sensing. I put this slide up just to remind me to mention that we do have some vertical information about the, the temperature and, and, and relative humidity from instruments like AIRS, it's an infrared sounder, 
Um, one of the limitations is that the uh, footprint of the instrument is 15 kilometers, which is not especially useful uh, directly for these aerosol cloud interaction questions, but can be useful as a model constraint. Okay, so summarizing satellite capabilities, frequent global coverage, that's really what we have to offer from the polar orbiting satellites. Geostationary satellites have high temporal resolution as well. Um, Multi-angle imagers off, offer this plume height and, and cloud top mapping. Uh, passive instruments can retrieve the total column aerosol optical depth. Active instruments can get some of the vertical structure. We get a certain amount of information about aerosol above clouds from the UV absorption technique, which I don't have time to go into, but instruments like OMI can do that, and also from the active sensors. We have some aerosol type information, but very qualitatively, um, and the active sensors uh, also provide some aerosol type information day and night. Okay, we keep moving. So one needs to be creative and to play to the strengths of what satellites can offer. That's kind of the bottom line on this. Now some of the issues in remote sensing, just go very quickly through a couple of these to show. So one of them is partly filled pixels. And this is my favorite paper on this, although there's a vast literature about this subject. But this goes way back to 1982. Um, this is a different Bretherton from our Chris Bretherton. This is Francis Bretherton and Jim Coakley. Uh, they had this neat idea of looking at the variability in the infrared channel uh, as a function of the actual brightness temperature in an infrared channel. And for cloud-free pixels, um, you get a warmer temperature. And for cloud-fully <coughs> filled pixels, you get a, a colder temperature. And for partly filled pixels, you get something in between. So if you have a single cloud layer, you get an arch. If you have several cloud layers, you get several partial arches. The challenge in this is to find the spatial scale over which to do the, to calculate the, the aggregate, the, do the aggregation for the standard deviation. But the technique is, is neat because this is, again, creative use of the satellite data. Another example of issues here is a, a nice paper by, by Donny and, and uh, Graham Feingold uh, in which they looked at differences in the um, indirect effect as calculated from AVHR and from Polder, and noting that the indirect effect as calculated from AVHR, and this was Terry Nakajima's paper that I referred to earlier, is significantly larger than Polder's. And what they found was that the sampling of these two techniques are rather different. And the AVHR, because of the way in which they do their uh, retrievals, they disfavor thin clouds. They want thick clouds because they want to avoid things like partly filled pixels and surface contributions, whereas with Polder, because they're using a different technique, uh, polarization, they wanted thin uniform clouds. And the differences between thick clouds and thin uniform clouds could at least qualitatively account for the differences in the indirect effect that was deduced from these satellites. So again, to be careful about what you conclude and why. So I'm just, just trying to give some. So another example of one of the issues, and this is why modelers need to work with the data producers, because these issues are all there. And we have to, this is called bluing. This is Sasha Marshak's contribution from a few years ago. And, and here, the idea is that if you have a cloud, and this is cloud optical depth for different wavelengths as a function of the enhancement, the brightening of the field of view as you look from space, and at shorter wavelengths, there's more scattering by the atmospheric molecules, and so it's tends to favor the blue, but this is now, this can be misinterpreted as an increase in aerosol optical depth. Um, so the things with the LIDAR were very clear, especially at night, uh, avoid this issue, but the vast amount of data, especially from the imagers, includes that. So the confounding effect of meteorology is something that's been talked about. And again, there's a vast literature here. I just picked something from, uh, from, from Toshi Matsui's thesis work at Colorado State years ago. He's now at Goddard with us. Um, but he took not only the, the aerosol information from MODIS, but used the, the, uh, the trim satellite to get the liquid water path and so on, and showed that the, the variation in liquid water path and the variation in the way in which the effective radius of the cloud particles varies as you go sample either at the top of the cloud, which would be a modus type short wavelength observation, or using the, other, the, the microwave and getting deeper into the cloud, you get a much bigger effect. 
So again, these are the kinds of things one has to think about uh, when one is using satellite data. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that CCN, a, a good part of the CCN spectrum in many cases, looks like molecules of air to a satellite. And you try and get to shorter wavelengths, and then you start seeing scattered light, and you have to deal with the absorption, and it gets complicated. Now, this is a famous uh, figure from Andy Andre. Um, I want to point to this is CCN, and this is aerosol optical depth at, at 500 nanometers, which is what we can measure here. And, and people would like to argue that, you know, okay, so we've got a linear relationship, but it's in log-log space, and you can see the error bars. And if you really want to do any kind of quantitative work, um, there are a lot of questions as to how seriously you can take that. The point was driven home in a paper by Tony Clark and Kapustin and Clark, uh, in which they took in situ measurements made with aircraft. They had a vast collection of these measurements that they had made over many years. And they showed, for example, that in a situation where you're looking at ambient aerosols, the relative humidity creates, okay, so there's the tight point cloud for particles that had been dried out and studied you know, carefully with aircraft in situ instruments. But here's what it looks like if, if you deal with the humidified particles. And so you need to have the vertical humidity structure, the height resolved aerosol type, the height resolved size distribution. You need all these things in order to be able to interpret a remote sensing uh, observation uh, simply in terms of CCN with those kinds of relationships. So it's difficult to do and quantitatively is probably not. This is a very recent paper that just came out in ACP. Um, so one other way of trying to get at this is one thing we can do from satellites is we can measure gas concentrations and OMI is one of the instruments that does that. Um, and so the, the idea was to look at the precursor gases and to try and find the relationships. And according to, some people have tried this and, and seen some kinds of relationships. Um, probably the trick is to stratify for conditions very, very carefully. Okay, I've, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, I've been going quickly, but I'll keep going quickly. Um, so the, the, the conclusion here was that there wasn't very much correlation if one looked broadly at this. So the question that I always ask, and this is probably the most important slide here, is that would you believe the answer if it were a surprise? So, okay. So two quick topics here to finish up. I've got two minutes. Um, Lazarus Ariopoulos at Goddard has started to do a classification of clouds uh, using the cloud top pressure and the cloud optical depth in a cluster analysis. Um, there's a lot of richness in this work here. He's correlated those different cloud types with the aerosol index, uh, some uh, a proxy for aerosol amount, and the precipitation. And these different cloud types statistically behave differently from each other. And he's then mapped out to a first approximation uh, which ones are consistent with cloud invigoration, under what circumstances, which ones are consistent uh, with the first and second indirect effect, that's the blue arrows, and then other effects that are going on. Again, I don't have time to talk about it except to mention that this is something that one can do with the satellite data. So these pieces have to work together. I'm going to come back to this slide in a minute, but I wanted to say one other thing, um, which is that, and, and, and this came up earlier today, um, we did an exercise, SAMCAM, Systematic Aircraft Measurements to Characterize Aerosol Air Masses. Uh, a number of people from this group are involved in this effort. Uh, and we started from first principles and said, to do aerosol direct aerosol radiative forcing, which takes us back to the beginning of the story here, what measurements do you need to make simultaneously to adequately characterize the aerosols? And we came up with a list of 15 of them. And uh, the idea was that if we could measure the microphysical properties adequately, we could do two things. One is we could improve our satellite retrieval algorithms because we have to assume microphysical properties. We don't have that much detail. We have these categories, these types, but what are the details? You have to get that from some other source. So that would be one thing. The other thing is that in our ability to translate from the satellite optical measurements to the mass, the mass that's uh, book kept, in climate models and aerosol transport models, you need the mass extinction efficiencies. Well, we can measure these things in situ. The one thing that makes this possible to do is that for a given source in a given season, a given aerosol source in a given season, the microphysical properties are repeatable. So some years there'll be a lot of smoke out of Alaska, some years a lot less. 
But smoke particles from burning material in Alaska wildfires is pretty similar from year to year. Same for Siberian smoke, although it's different from Alaska smoke. So we have to do this on a continuing basis. And I'll finish with this slide here, uh, which is just to say that these pieces all have a role to play. And we've heard a lot about modeling today. Uh, modeling, obviously, is the one way in which you can make predictions. It's also a, 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 the most effective way we know to synthesize everything that we can do. Satellites give us global information, and we have to take advantage of that provided we stratify adequately in order to separate the different physical mechanisms. This is part of the art of it. And then the in situ measurements, which provide detail that's unobtainable from space and absolutely necessary for us to address the question of aerosol cloud interaction. And I'll stop there. Thank you.